Hi guys, it's Miss Brown speaking. So we are continuing our study of probability and we are going to talk about compound events. Now we talked about this last week as well. If you notice last week, I only gave you two events at the same time. We want to focus on what can we do if we have more than two events three four five events we could have more so we used two models to help us find the sample space remember that the sample space is just a list of all outcomes So the first thing I want to focus on is the table as a probability model. Now there's an issue with the table. The table can only do two things at a time. So what you're going to find is we might have to make multiple tables when we start having more than two events. So today we're going to focus on spinning a spinner the spinner has the colors red, blue, and yellow. Notice that the spinner is divided into equal sections. So this spinner has three possible outcomes. And then we're going to put our hand in a bag and draw out a chip. And the chips are numbered one, two or three so this bag has three possible outcomes and then we're going to flip a coin and of course a coin has two sides heads or tails so this coin has two outcomes so as i said i'm going to use a table and the table can only do two things at a time. So first I'm going to focus on what happens when I spin my spinner and pull a chip out of the bag. Notice both of those have three outcomes. Therefore, I'm going to need a three by three table. So I'm going to make a three by three table. And I am going to let the top column represent, actually I'm going to let the side represent red, blue, and yellow. So those are my three rows. And then my columns are going to be one, two, and three. So that is my three by three table. So this first cell would represent getting a red one, red two, red three, then blue one, blue two, blue three, yellow one, yellow two and yellow three but here's the issue we've only looked at the spinner and the bag what about the coin so now we're going to have to incorporate another table notice the table that we just made the three by three table has nine 
possible outcomes. So our new table is going to be composed of what's happening in the table we just made plus flipping the coin. Therefore, our new table is going to have to be 9 by 2. Okay? So, I'm going to try to make a 9 by 2 table. This is going to be kind of hard. I can already see that. Okay, I think I'm going to have to go horizontal. And let me actually write in my headings first. So I'm going to take my headings straight from here. Okay, so that's going to be red one red two red three blue one blue two blue three yellow one yellow two and yellow three okay now let me draw my table Okay, now, so I've covered the outcomes from the table we just made. Now I need to list the possible outcomes of my coin, which would be heads or tails. And now I am ready. To list my sample space. Let me draw my cells in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So this cell right here would be red one heads red one tails red two heads red two tails red three heads red three tails blue one heads blue one tails blue two heads blue two tails blue three heads blue three tails yellow one heads yellow one tails yellow two heads yellow two tails yellow three heads yellow three tails and that covers it so notice that we have 
when we incorporate, oopsies, when we incorporate the spinner, the pulling a chip out of the bag and flipping a coin, we have 18 outcomes or 18 total possibilities. Now, all of this stuff in my table is my sample space which is my list of outcomes something else i want you to notice is that remember we said we had three outcomes on the spinner that were possible three outcomes in the bag that were possible and two outcomes on the coin well let's look at what happens if we multiply three times three times two. Using order of operations, I'm going from left to right. Three times three is nine. I still need to multiply that by two. Nine times two is 18. Hmm. And we came out with 18 outcomes. Okay, so we've been focusing on the table Honestly, when I have something like this, I generally don't use a table. I generally use a tree diagram. So let's look at what this might look like if we do a tree diagram. The thing about a tree diagram is it's not like a table. It can handle more than two things at a time. It can really handle as many as you want. But tree diagrams tend to go everywhere. They will sprawl all across your paper. And you'll see what I mean here in a second. So let's look at what happens if I spin that spinner. If I spin that spinner, I can either get a red a blue, or a yellow. Okay, now let's look what happens when I pull a chip from the bag. So let's pretend like I had spun the spinner and I had gotten red, okay? And now I go to pull a chip out of the bag. Well, if I pull a chip out of the bag, I'm either going to pull a one, a two, or a three. Well, let's pretend like I had spun the spinner, I got red and then I pulled a chip. I pulled the number one. Well, when I spin the coin, what's possible? I can either get heads or tails. Okay, so I'm going to finish this out. Now, that's just the possibilities for landing on red. What if I had landed on blue? Well, when I go to pull a chip, I'm going to either get a one, a two, or a three. And then when I go to flip the coin, either heads or tails. Okay, same thing with yellow. If I land on yellow and I go to pull a chip out of the bag, I'm either going to get a one, a two, or a three. And when I go to flip my coin, I'm either going to get a heads or a tails.
Okay, so we have to know how to to read the tree diagram. The tree diagram is honestly useless if you don't know how to read it. So, if I start down here, I'm going to travel from red. So notice I started at red, I'm going to one, and then heads. So that's red, one, heads. Starting at red, one, tails. That's red, one, tails. Starting at red, two, heads. That's red, two, heads. Starting at red again, two, tails. That's red, two, tails. Starting at red, three heads, red, three heads, red, three tails. Okay, going over to blue, blue, one heads. Again, blue, one tails. Blue two heads, blue two tails, blue three heads, blue three tails. Yellow one heads, yellow one tails, yellow two heads, yellow two tails. Yellow three heads, yellow three tails, and we're done. So let's look at how many possible outcomes we had. We had one, two, three, four. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. If you look, we have the same information that we have in our table. It might be organized a little bit differently, but again, it is essentially the same information. Okay. So those are our two probability models. Now, we have to, the reason why we're doing this is that we need to be able to make predictions in real life. So let's go to making some predictions in real life. So we're going to make predictions about Mrs. Brown's playground lotto. All right, so Mrs. Brown is hosting a playground lottery. Students must pay $2 to play. To win, a student must spin red, draw the number three, and land on tails. All of that has to happen. And if a student wins, they get $10. So that's not bad. Go in with $2 and come out with $10, right? <laughs> so what is the probability of winning? So the probability of winning is just the probability of, well, what does it take to win? You have to land on red. You have to get the number three. And 
you have to get tails. All of that has to occur. So let's look at the probability of getting red, three, and tails. So I'm going back to my probability model. Let's look for red, three, tails. And my red, three, tails is right here. Okay, so I have one red three tails out of, remember we said that we had 18 outcomes. So basically one out of every 18 students should win, right? All righty then. Well, let's look at that. One out of 18. Hmm. To turn that to a percent, I would take the one and I would divide that by 18. And then I'm going to arrow over, if this will let me. And I'm going to multiply that by 100. So your probability of winning Miss Brown's Playground Lotto is 5.5555. So that's approximately 6%. Okay. That's why I'm putting these wavy lines. Approximately 6%. How would you describe that? Remember when we describe, when we describe probability, we use words like impossible, unlikely, equally likely, likely, and certain. Well, 6%, um, that's unlikely. In fact, that's highly unlikely. Okay. So, now, what is your probability of not winning? So, we already found the probability of winning. What is our probability of not winning? Well, remember we talked about something called complementary events. And we said that those complementary events sum to one whole or 100%. So, the complement of winning is not winning. So, if my probability of winning is eight, 1 18th, then all I have to do is take one whole and subtract from it 1 18th. And that'll give me my probability of not winning. Now, we're dealing with fractions. And this one, I can represent that number one in a different form. And it still means one. I'm going to represent the number one as 18 over 18. I need you to think about that. What's 18 divided by 18? 18 divided by 18 is one. So it's still one. It looks different. I used a nickname of one, if you want to call it that. Okay, so I'm going to subtract, and that gives me 17 eighteenths. So my probability of winning is 7, I'm sorry, the probability of not winning is 17 eighteenths. So that means 17 out of 18 students will not win. Let's look at that as a percent. So 
All I have to do, remember we have 6% here. So all I would have to do is take 100% and subtract from it the 6%. That gives me 94. So 94% of students will not win. How are you feeling about Miss Brown's Playground Lotto? <laughs> okay, so we're putting a lot of things together. We've already talked about compound events. We've talked about sample space. We've talked about probabilities. We've talked about describing probabilities. Now we're going to throw in predictions. So Miss Brown has 126 students. If all Ms. Brown students play, predict how many will win. There are different ways to do this, but remember, going back to our probability here, this says that we have one winner out of every 18 total students. Okay, well, notice all of Ms. Brown's students are playing. So that's 126 total students. We have to figure out what goes here. And I'm going to put W for winner. We could use cross products or we could use scaling. A lot of my kids will look at those numbers and not necessarily know um, what they could use to scale. So I'm just going to use cross product products. I'm going to multiply 18 times W, and that's going to give me 18 W equals, and then I'm going to multiply 1 times 126, which gives me 126. Okay? And then I am going to isolate that variable. I need to get the variable by itself. Right now, the variable is being multiplied by 18. So I'm going to do the opposite or reverse of multiplication, which is division. I'm dividing both sides by 18. 18 divided by 18 is 1, leaving me with 1w equals, and I'm going to grab my calculator, 126. divided by 18 gives me seven. So I should have seven winners. Now, let me show you an alternate way of doing that problem. Notice again, right here, when we have this one eighteenth, that means one 18th of all students will win. So all my students is 126. So 1 18th of 126 students will win. Well, remember the word of in math generally indicates multiplication. So I could go 118 times 126. I'm going to grab my handy dandy calculator, clear that out. I'm going to go 1 fraction button, 18, arrow over, and remember of means multiplication, so I'm multiplying that by 126, and that still gives me 7, okay? So that's an alternate way of doing that problem. That still tells me I should have 7 winners. Okay, so how much money will Miss Brown make? Well, let's think about this. Or we're predicting. It's not it's not definite, but we're predicting. Let's think about this. So Miss Brown has a hundred and twenty-six students that are playing, right? How much did they pay to play? They paid two dollars to play. Okay. So if we take 100 and 
$126 and multiply that, or 126 students, and multiply that by $2. That means there was a total of $252 collected from those students to play Miss Brown's Playground Lotto. Shame on Miss Brown. Now, we predict there will be seven winners, right? So if we have seven winners, and remember the prize for winning is $10. So if we give all those winners $10, seven times 10 is $70. So, Miss Brown's going to have to give back $70. But wait a minute. Miss Brown took in $252, but she only gave back $70. So, if we subtract $252 minus $70, Hmm, <laughs> that means Miss Brown just earned $182 from her students. Not bad for a day's work, right? I don't know about Miss Brown. <laughs> Thank you guys. Have a great day. Bye bye.